This is a friendship Sunday school class. <clears throat> the lesson for June 13, 2021, and the title is New Romans 22. Father, thank you so much for letting us meet together in peace and in safety, and we ask that you be with us as we study this lesson. <clears throat> Remember, we have been studying uh, what is meant by Paul in the 11th chapter of Romans, all Israel will be saved, and we have gone uh, quite a way in that we have uh, looked at uh, a period called the Day of the Lord, which is the time when God's judgment will be poured out on the unbelieving earth. And we have seen two things happen. Number one, the beginning of the day of the Lord, which is more than one day, but it's the beginning of that day. And uh, the beginning of the day is held up by the identification and sealing of 144,000 Jews. And then once they are uh, in place and are under God's protection, we then have uh, seen the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, what is known as the rapture of the church. And we've now um, positioned ourselves in, in heaven and we see a number of things. We have now the uh, church in, in heaven, and then the uh, 144,000 sealed Jews on earth going through the day of the Lord, but with divine intervention and protection. So we have been then introduced in chapter 12 of Revelation to a sign, a vision, of a woman. And the woman uh, is pretty clearly Israel, but not all of Israel, a faithful remnant of Israel. It was a woman who is pregnant and about to bear a man-child so that we can identify this as the portion of Israel faithful to God, but not to Christ. And uh, they are going to be the source for the person of Jesus, the Son of God, the one who has come to redeem people from the earth. Now, so we have regarded this vision of the woman and uh, we know that they are on earth while we are in heaven and we know that we are told that they will go to a place of safety and we now come to this question where will they go on earth so that they will be protected and safe. And I have said that they will they almost surely, probably will go to Petra or Basra. Those are two closely allied places. And, and to Egypt and Assyria. And now I want to consider these places and the justification for saying that those are the locations where they will go. Now this is a map of uh, Jordan, the southern part of Jordan, um, which contains Edom and Moab in the middle and Ammon at the top. And the southern part of that land there are two cities. Uh, they're really closer than they look on this map. One is called Basra, 
And now be careful because there's another Basra in Iraq, and we're not talking about that one. The one we're talking about is down here in Edom, southern part of Jordan. And uh, Basra is the uh, Hebrew name for what at one time was the capital of Edom uh, in this area. Uh, the name Basra, B-O-Z-R-A-H, means sheepfold. That's just like where you put your sheep at night to uh, keep them safe. And the other is Petra, which in the Hebrew, in, not in Hebrew, but in Greek, is means stone, rock. And so that's the first one that we want to take up. Now this is a close-up, a closer-up of a, a surface map of Petra. Uh, people know that very well, and they uh, would automatically think that's where anyone looking for safety would go. Petra, uh, as you can see, has got these uh, brownish things, and these are carved buildings. That's the buildings there were were carved out of sandstone, and then you can see the trails that that mark uh, throughout there. And it's notorious for being a place that could easily be defended, because the only way in and out is through these small passageways and we'll talk a little bit more about Petra but that certainly is a place that the woman could be taken the meaning that the woman now meaning uh, the believing Jews believing in the sense of Judaism but not Christian so they could be taken there for safe keeping. Now here are some of the characteristics of Petra or Basra. The Petra particularly was the ancient capital of the Nabataeans, a, 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 a native uh, Arabian uh, group of people. And <clears throat> under their their management, it became quite a complicated and very well-known area. Later, it became a Roman city, and then finally, ultimately, became the Edomite uh, stronghold. And and the Basra was the uh, former capital of of Edom. It was well known as a Spice Trading Center, a very complicated architecture with uh, these carved buildings, and it was especially well known for its water system and the management of water, because this area is prone to periodic flooding, which can be a problem, but otherwise is very short on water. Uh, and so in order to make it possible for people to live comfortably in that area throughout the year, they had a very complicated and sophisticated management of water. Now, and the overall, it was known to be easy to defend, but a difficult passage. And uh, it ultimately became an Edomite uh, area. And it, it had two purposes of interest to us. One is it was, easy, it was very easy to defend, and therefore people in there were relatively safe from attack. But at the same time, it was surrounded by Edomites, who uh, God has said repeatedly he hates, and therefore, people inside um, Petra 
while they could be safe from attack from without, they, they all also couldn't just move around freely wherever they wanted to go because they were potentially uh, surrounded and, in fact, maybe uh, uh, encased by the Edomites. They also were prone to multiple earthquakes, and uh, there were several that diminished the size of, of, of this area. The people who have looked carefully at Petra, particularly, have determined that the maximum population, when it was prominent and before it began to decay, was about 30,000 people. And uh, Basra, the nearby town, uh, means sheepfold. Now, the maximum population of 30,000, uh, although a common idea would be that these Jews, these women, these uh, sealed Jews, could could very well go there and be safe, but you got about 144,000 Jews packed into a place that at the most held about 30,000. That's not very good. And so we are looking at another, uh, uh, we'll be looking at other possibilities. Basra was not uh, liked, and the, and the Edomites were not liked. In Jeremiah 49, the Lord says, I've sworn by myself, declares the Lord, Basra will become an object of horror, a reproach, a ruin, and a curse, and all its cities will become perpetual ruins. And then just a few verses later, he says, Behold, he will mount up and swoop like an eagle and spread out his wings against Basra. And the hearts of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be like the heart of a woman in labor. And in Isaiah in 34, it says, my sword is saturated, is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. And you can quickly see uh, the attitude of the Lord toward Edom. The descendants of Esau and then he goes on to say, The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Now the prophet Isaiah gives us some additional information that will help in uh, Isaiah chapter 19, it says, And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. And the land, the Lord shall smite Egypt. He'll smite and heal it and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. And Isaiah 19 also says, Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Again in Isaiah 19, it says, In that day, the day of the Lord, I have gone through uh, the scripture beginning with all the, with the prophetic books, Isaiah, 
And any time you see a phrase that says in that day or that day or the day, you can be very sure that we'll be up in a passage having to do with the day of the Lord. And Isaiah 19.23 says, In that day, the day of the Lord, shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. And in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria even a blessing in the midst of the land. And here is a, a, a map that's been constructed. Uh, and it says a highway from Egypt through Israel to Assyria from Isaiah 19.23. This yellow line goes from Assyria, which is in uh, that part of Iraq, it goes over and comes across Lebanon into Israel and then terminates over in Egypt. So this is a highway that people can go back and forth on. And it's a relatively safe highway. And it goes, it ties together these three places. Now, there are other people, other Jews that are uh, scattered in different places, but it begins to surface that the, the major part of these Jewish people are going to be either in Egypt, in Petra, uh, which, in, which is going to be in Jordan, or over in Assyria. Now, let's go on. If we turn our attention to the end of World War I, when there was a wholesale with, uh, redrawing of maps of the countries and renaming, and this is the, what's called a New Assyria, 1915 to 1923 after World War I. And you can see here's another Basra, and I warned you about that. This is not the same as the one in Jordan. Here's Baghdad. We know where that is. Here's Beirut, Damascus the Ottoman Empire, and so on. Now, let me call your attention to Mosul, and it's uh, in New Assyria. Let's talk just a moment about this. <clears throat> One of the uh, empires that conquered Israel was Assyria. <clears throat> and Assyria, when when, uh, when Israel split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel or Samaria, and the southern kingdom, kingdom called Judah, <clears throat> the Assyrians began to trouble Israel. And they gradually took it away. Um, first, they got the, the three tribes the, um, that, that settled on the east side of Jordan. And then they chose to stay over on the east side of Jordan where there was lots of water and green grass. And so the Assyrians took that group away, and then subsequently in 722 B.C., they, they took the rest of the northern part, or that, what was called Israel, Ephraim, Samaria, and so on. They conquered it. Now, there was one, one of the prominent prophets 
to the northern kingdom uh, <clears throat> was told to go to uh, the capital of uh, the capital of Assyria. And uh, the Lord said, their evil has come up before me. I want you to go and proclaim judgment upon them. Well, uh, we know that story. Uh, the prophet refused initially to go to the capital of Assyria. And he tried to run away to, in a different direction. Finally, he got thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, vomited near uh, the city, of, uh, near, near the uh, Assyrian capital. And then the Lord says, Now, why don't you go and tell them what I told you to tell them? And he did, and he came and said, Forty days came, will come judgment, destruction. But they repented, and the Lord relented from dis destroying them. And that was the case for about 50 years. Because of their repentance, the Lord did not destroy the capital city. But about 50 years later, uh, there was a destruction. Now, <clears throat> if you remember uh, seeing on TV and so on, the city of Mosul, uh, it was a, attacked by ISIS with the uh, intent of um, producing a caliphate. And Mosul was attacked, but ultimately ISIS was was defeated there. Now, <clears throat> Mosul is the site of the former capital of Assyria. And the Assyrians in that, in that part of the country, along with some Kurds, were the first in that area, according to their own history, to adopt Christianity. And so we have a seat of Christianity here that were uh, persecuted, spread around, but ultimately settled in that. And they became one end of this, this, this highway that existed, which would go down through uh, Lebanon, and down to Egypt, I'm sorry, to Israel, and then end up the far end in uh, <coughs> Egypt. So uh, we can pull it closer to modern day. Now, after the rapture of the church, we see in Revelation 7, it says, After these things I looked in heaven, and behold a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now the red arrow says there's more to it. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, the time after the Antichrist moves his throne into the temple and sets up his throne, declares that he is God, and demands that he be worshipped as God or be killed. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. 
and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So now we have two groups of people of interest, the raptured church in heaven and the sealed Jews on earth. Sealed Jews are not Christians. They're faithful remnants of the largely unbelieving Jews who are faithful to God in the sense of Judaism, but are not Christians specifically. They are awaiting the coming of the Messiah, but do not accept that Jesus is that Messiah. Now, what is God going to do with these Jews? A great sign uh, vision appeared in heaven. This is in chapter 12. And chapter 12 of Revelation begins a period in which things are introduced that have not been, that have already been introduced before but additional information is given about them this great sign appeared in heaven it was a woman clothed with the sun the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars and she was with child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, don't lose your orientation. The vision, the sign is in heaven, but what the woman represents are on earth, the sealed Jews, 144,000. Who is the woman? Well, not Israel except it's not Israel entirely. It is not Mary, the mother of Christ. It's not the church. It is part of Israel. It is pregnant Israel. It is the Israel from whom will come after the flesh, Christ, Jesus. I'm going to show you the prophetic dreams of Joseph as part of the basis for knowing this, and that will be in the next slide. Is not all of racial Israel, it's pregnant Israel from whom the Messiah will come after the flesh. Now, we talk here as though it be will come in the future, but this is actually historical. And it's equivalent to the believing remnant of Israel. It's essentially the same of the 144,000 sealed Jews, certainly not all racial Jews of all time. Now, the woman, remember, is on earth during the great, this is during the, the day of the Lord. The vision is being seen in heaven. The dreams of Joseph, you go back to Genesis 37. Uh, <clears throat> Jacob had the Joseph, uh, his uh, next to the youngest son. And Joseph was talking to his brothers, and he told them a dream he had. For behold, we brothers were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Now that will not endear him to his brothers. And a couple of verses later, he tells them about a second dream. He said, Now he, Joseph, had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars, meaning that there were, were bowing down to me. There were twelve stars altogether and the other eleven were bowing down to me. And his father, Jacob, understood the import of the dream and said, You mean that I and my wife, 
your mother are going to bow down to you. Well, in fact, they did. But this even made his brothers angrier to, at Joseph. Then in Zechariah, a late end-time prophet, that I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now this is a marker. Uh, by this, Zechariah pinpoints the point where when the Jews who are in this vision and are now on, at the time, or on earth in the day of the Lord, when they see Christ, when they see Jesus, then they will instantly understand that they have misjudged him and that this is in fact the Messiah that they have pierced. And they will instantly come to uh, worship him as the Messiah. So now, let's look at Christ returning to the earth. Jesus, when he comes back to earth, will return to Petra or Basra, where he will break out those in Petrus. Remember, they are in captivity by the surrounding Edomites. And the prophet Micah says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, Basra, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. And the next verse says, the breaker, that's uh, uniformly been understood as a person, redeemer, who will come to break them out of Petra. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So the king goes on before them and the Lord at their head. And in the process, as we will see, he will kill some of the surrounding Edomites. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The Deliverer will come from heavenly Zion, that's Christ, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. But in, all, in another sense, a Redeemer will come to earthly Zion, this is Christ come to earth, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. So, let's understand, Christ will come from heaven where he has been sitting on the throne. He will come to uh, the region around Petra and Basra. And then he will come to earthly Zion from there. Now, earthly Zions that were at Jerusalem. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. Going to Isaiah chapter 63. Envision this as a uh, next few verses are going to be a dialogue. You imagine a man that stands there and he sees this person. He says, Who is this who comes from Edom? Now remember, coming from where? Edom. With garments of glowing colors from Basra. This one who is majestic in his apparel marching in the greatness of his strength. The answer comes, It's I who speak in righteousness, 
mighty to save. We reply back to him, Why is your apparel red, and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the people there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked. There was no one to help. I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger, and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Then the Jews will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria along this highway. I will settle in them, them in their houses, declares the Lord. Jesus will lead this group to Mount Zion at Jerusalem. And I'm going to stop here. Then I looked. And behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. So to recapitulate, Jesus has come to earth, broken the people out of Petra, I don't know how the word gets around, but the word does get around. And so the Jews came from along the highway from Assyria and from Egypt. Now let's take it up there. The, he now led this group over to the Mount Zion, the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley from uh, Jerusalem. Let's look at it as we go along further. Father, thank you. Thank you so much that we are seeing the picture of what it is, what it means and how it is done that all Israel will be saved. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.